It generally leads to great conversation and, and obviously a great meal. So uh, I will get started. We're going to do a little bit of uh, TV magic here in the live demo today. So the panna cotta takes about three hours to set up in the refrigerator. So it, uh, when, you, when you make it, we use gelatin in it, so to, which, which helps uh, form the, the shape that we want it to hold. So I have some already done, so then they will be magically done for us today. But, uh, and the recipe will, uh, will be posted on their website. I did not get a chance to get the recipe to them to, uh, for today to hand out. But if you check out their website, they will have the recipe. And I'll throw in a couple other little things that I do with it as far as the mushrooms and other, other add-ons you can do to the dish as well. So to start off with, uh, we're going to get the, the custard started. And to do that, I'm just going to take a, a, a nice uh, medium-sized stock pot or saucepan, uh, put it over medium to low heat. And I have uh, here in the mix, I have four cups of uh, manufacturing heavy, heavy cream and two cups of 2% uh, whole milk. And I'm going to go ahead and throw that into the pot here, and I'm going to slowly start to heat it up. I don't want it to get hot yet. I don't want it to start to simmer until I add in the corn into it. And then we'll use this liquid, the milk and the cream, as our poaching liquid to cook the corn. So we're going to throw that in there. And then we'll process the corn down and uh, get it so that we can get a nice smooth texture. And I'm spilling my milk all over the counter. These lids are smarter than I am. All right. So the trick is, obviously, when you're using anybody that, that's you know, tried to cook with milk and cream at home is don't get it too hot. You want to if you scald the bottom, it's going to ruin the flavor and also it also changes the texture of the of the custard and the cream as well. So be very careful about that. So I have it on low heat and it'll get going here. So next we're going to get our corn ready. Uh, anybody out there when we're shucking corn get tired of the of the silks that are in uh, in in the corn. Uh, one of the, one of the the tricks to, that I found to be able to get it out of there is as we peel the after we peel the the corn back. The, after we peel the, the husks back and you get a little bit of that silk on there, just take a clean dish towel and just polish it off. Basically, it just the, 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 the towel will help pull out the rest of those, those silks in there. So you get a nice clean ear of corn so it's easier for you to use. So uh, we're going to do this. We're going to cut the, car the kernels off the cob. As I make my mess up here, the uh, the this time of year, uh, corn kind of uh, is at its peak. It's if anything, it's starting to to be a little bit more uh, starchy than it is sweet. And you want to make sure that you get some that are nice white corn um, that's nice and sweet. So you know, when you're at the grocery store, the grocery store people won't like this, but open it up and pull a couple of the kernels out and taste it. You're buying the corn, might as well taste it. Make sure you get the right one before you before you leave to come home. And uh, no reason to get home and realize you don't have what you, what you really wanted to have. So these are good sized ears. So I'm going to go with four, four ears of corn here. And then the other trick is when you're uh, cutting uh, the kernels off the cob, uh, so you don't have them just flying all over your kitchen. My recommendation is you, you get a, a, a nice sharp knife that's not too big, but that will fit into a, a vessel that you're trying to use. In this case, I'm using the bowl. Put your corn in, and then put your corn with a towel in the bottom so it holds your corn in place so it doesn't roll around. That way, when you cut it off, the corn falls off right into the bowl, and you don't have it flying all over the counter, and you're not going to lose as many pieces. When you're uh, preparing your corn, if you, if you really want to get all that goodness, uh, when you're cutting it off, you have, still have some of the meat on here, you can take the back of your knife. I do this sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I don't do it, but you take the back of your knife and you actually scrape right along the cob and it pulls out more of the, of the kernel, which is, which is actually embedded into, into, the, into the cob itself. And you'll actually get a little bit more of the, of the liquid out of it, which is what I just have, help add flavor to, uh, to, what you're trying to what you're trying to make.
All right, so we'll go with this one here. Get rid of these cobs. So we're gonna go ahead and add this corn uh, right to our to our uh, liquid here, to our cream and our our milk. We can turn the heat up a little bit now that we're adding the corn into it, and we're gonna bring this up to a simmer. Uh, we want it to to, to not really uh, boil too much, but we want to let it simmer for about about three minutes, three to four minutes. And what that does is that cooks the corn and just takes away the the raw starchiness that uh, that is inherited in the in the corn itself. And also, we're starting to impart that corn flavor into the cream, which will make the which is the base of our of our panna cotta. To the to the uh, poaching liquid here, I'm going to add some seasoning. It's very subtle. I don't want to um, take away from that corn flavor. I really want that's the that's the idea. This whole thing is to be a nice, rich, velvety custard that just has a very nice, sweet, uh, natural corn flavor. So I'm adding a little bit of white pepper, just a couple of pinches, a little bit of cayenne pepper, because I like to have a little bit of heat as well. And then I have a, a touch of sugar as well. And the sugar just uh, kind of helps ensure that the corn is not quite as sweet as I need it to be. That sugar will just help give it up to where I where I want it. It's not meant to be um, taste like a, like a dessert, but I would definitely want it to be uh, to be naturally sweet in flavor. And then I'm adding a little bit of kosher salt to it. And we will let that go for a few minutes here. And while that's going, we're going to go ahead and get started on the heirloom tomato relish that goes with it. The heirloom tomato relish is, uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, before I do that, we're gonna go ahead and bloom our gelatin. Uh, I brought gelatin sheets. That's a recipe that I have that, that I'll post online. It, I use gelatin sheets. Uh, it is a little bit harder to, to find. Um, commercially, we get it. It's really good for mousses and gelatins, our, our things, because it, it melts a lot smoother and it's a lot, uh, not a lot nicer texture. Uh, I'm using eight sheets, which is equivalent to two packets of uh, powdered gelatin. So if you have it at home, my recommendation would be actually to bloom the powdered gelatin in the uh, milk before you added it to the uh, to the liquid. You don't want to add any more liquid because it's going to throw off your balance, so if your ratio. But you can bloom it in the cold milk and then add it to it. In this case, uh, I'll just show you what we do with these. We just soak them in cold water for a few minutes and they will, they will get soft. And then when this gets hot, I'll whisk them into it. Another trick for those of you who like to make gingerbread houses at the winter time, these make really nice stained glass windows. So if you can find them, like a Sur La Table or someplace like that, it's really fun. You can put it inside your gingerbread house and uh, not that I've done that or anything, but uh, <laughs> so I'll let those sit here for a few minutes and, and start to soften up for me. So in uh, the heirloom tomato relish that I'm doing today, uh, my goal is to, to have just great flavor, sweet uh, tartiness, the, the acidity from the tomatoes, but also it's, it's about color and presentation because this is, this is where the dish is really gonna pop in color. So pick a variety of color of tomatoes. If you, if you go into your market or local produce, uh, produce stand and you look around and make sure you get a good variety and good colors of heirloom tomatoes. We live in an area where we can, I mean, at times we can get hundreds of different uh, varieties of, of tomatoes. Uh, from zebra stripe to the Julia Child to tomato to to the Sun uh, Sun Crisp ones, whatever you can get your hold, uh, get your hands on, I would definitely recommend. And also, I brought in a, a basket of uh, organic uh, heirloom cherry tomatoes. And again, so it's the same color profile, but in small portions. And I'll leave them larger, and, and they just look nice in the presentation. So I'll pick out. I'm going to pick out a one of each color for me for today. I have a the crimson. I have the gold, and I'm going to pick out a nice uh, red tomato. And in this trick, grab a serrated knife. Cutting tomatoes, you're always gonna find your life much easier if you start off with a serrated tomato. Our serrated knife to cut the tomato is gonna cut through the skins and, and you're gonna get a lot nicer cut on it. So we'll just slice these into nice thin slices and we'll dice them up as we go here. Moisture is, is we wanna have the moisture so I'm, I don't de-seed them. I let the seeds be in there because if I de-seeded it, I'd have I'd take, be taking away a lot of the natural moisture and flavor. So I'm gonna leave that, leave that in the seeds in this, in this recipe. And when you're making this, if you decide to make it with the panna cotta, this is uh, 
the, the tomato relish uh, doubles as all kinds of great things going in a salad, goes on crostinis for bruschetta. You can uh, throw it on your pizza. You can uh, throw it on your breakfast cereal if you really like tomatoes. It's really nice and it holds for, for a day or two in the refrigerator and it, uh, it just is, has, the longer it sits for a couple of days, the better the flavor gets. It just gets more intense and the, the flavors really come out. So we're just gonna go ahead and dice these up. And when you're making this dish, like as I said, the panna cotta is gonna take a couple of hours to set up. So my recommendation is go ahead and take the time to make the relish ahead of time so that it actually has time to sit in the refrigerator and the flavors have time to marinate and to marry together. And, to, and when we add the basil to it, it'll really help extract that, that flavor out. And plus, then you're, when you, if you're making it for, a, for friends that are coming over for a party, then you really don't have to do much but pull it out, plate it up, and, and go. It's, it's pretty much all done and ready to go uh, for, the, for the event. Any questions yet? No? Good, see? Doing my part, okay. <laughs> Heirloom tomatoes today were brought in from Swank Farms. Uh, uh, being a chef here uh, in, the, in the Monterey Peninsula, I work out in, in Monterey, but just in this area, we find uh, that we have such a great variety and such a great availability to these uh, these passionate farmers and their product that they bring to us. And so when we uh, we have the opportunity to work with with these 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 farmers and the the folks that are out there, we, we get to know them on a personal first name basis. And and so often they're they are so excited to see us be creative and, and do great things with their product. And and as chefs, we we know we're getting the best product that's coming in. It's coming a lot of times. I'll call up and I'll say, Yeah, we're picking it right now. We'll get it to you this afternoon. Nowhere do we get product uh, unless we're at our own home garden that it actually is picked that day for us and shows up at our doorstep. As I mentioned earlier, the, the custard that we're making itself is really a good base for uh, a lot of different fun things, and you can, you can play around with it for the different times of years uh, that whenever you want to serve it. So we're getting close here, coming up to a, up to a simmer. I'm going to keep a close eye on it here. And uh, then our, our next step will be to process the corn, blend, blend the corn up. So as I mentioned, the, the flavor and the relish is is very simple. I want it to be true in flavor. I want the tomatoes to come out. Because we're doing it with the sweet corn panna cotta, I am going to add a little bit of corn to it just to give it a little bit of color and a little bit of extra texture. So I'll just take a couple of the kernels. I'm not going to cut too deep because I really just want the, the sweet fleshy part off the top of the corn to, to go into the dish. Throw that in with the corn or with the tomatoes. I'm going to here we go. Now we're at to simmer on the on the corn. So now I'm just like I said, I'm gonna let it simmer for about three minutes, and then I'm gonna blend it. So quickly on the relish, we're gonna add a little bit of olive oil. We're gonna add a little bit of red wine vinegar. And again, we don't want it to be a vinaigrette. We want it just to help uh, help with the flavors uh, that we're creating with the with the tomatoes. So. We'll go ahead and give that a quick toss, a little pinch of salt. We'll let that sit for a minute while we work on the rest of our, our thing here. So this is at a full simmer. We'll turn this down. And just let that go for one second. All right, so the next, the next part of this uh, is a little bit this is where the little bit of finesse and technique comes into it. This is uh, the, the way I go about taking out, the, I want the flavor of the corn, but I don't want the texture of the kernels in the, in the actual panna cotta. It's gonna disrupt the, the, the silkiness of the, of the, of the panna cotta. So I'm gonna strain uh, the corn out and then I'm gonna blend it in the blender and then I'll pass it through a, a tamis or a, a fine sieve and, and I'll scrape out. So I'll just get the, 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 the flavor and the, and the, 
the creaminess of the corn to come out into the into the uh, panna cotta. So I'm going to go ahead and hold on to the liquid. And add the corn corn to the blender here. Realized when I got here today I didn't have the lid, so we'll hopefully not make too much of a mess. To help with that, I want to make sure I don't put too much more liquid in there. I really just want the corn to get blended up. All right. So usually just put enough liquid just to barely cover the corn. We'll throw that onto the blender here. Let that run for about about a minute or so. Get ourselves cleaned up where we're working. So uh, at home, uh, very often we'd have a smaller strainer at, uh, in, the, in our kitchens. This is our tamis. This is what we use for sifting for flowers, or in this case, uh, also if we make purees, if we want to make a parsnip puree or carrot puree, we don't want any chunks in it. This is generally what we take the time to pass it through to get that nice uh, velvety texture that we want on it. So I'm just going to take this in small batches. It, as you can see, as I pour it here, it's, it's thickened up. It's kind of almost like the consistency of a porridge. And we're just pour that on there using our our bowl scraper or, or bench knife, I'm just going to pass it right over the top. And I'll show you what the, what the result is, why we do this in just a second. So as I said, I, I, I want that flavor of that corn. That's, that's the whole point of this, this exercise in this dish. But I don't want all the kernels. So we have all this very fibrous part, which is the, the husk and the, or the the outside part of the kernel, we're, we're trying to remove that. We don't want that into our, in our dish today. So we're going to go ahead and remove that as I make a mess in my... I do have a pan over here. It's not the floor, in case, in case anybody was wondering. Last little bit here. Now we're going to add this back to our pot. Uh, we need to bring it back up to a simmer because we need to be able to set the gelatin. We're next, we're going to add the gelatin back into it. So we add our, add our uh, poaching liquid that we took off. We go ahead and we'll add this mixture back in. The nice, very, it's basically just a corn puree that we have in here. We get all that goodness right back into the pot. Stir it up. And this point, when we put it back on the heat, we have to be careful because now that it's got a lot of sugar and starch in it, it's going to want to burn to the bottom very quickly. So we're just going to keep an eye on it, keep it moving. And we're going to come back over here to our gelatin. So you saw the sheets that I had put in there. Now we're at a point where it's they've all softened up. And you get to this nice kind of just a gelatinous -y kind of uh, fruit roll-up type texture on the thing, uh, on the gelatin. And then we're just going to drop that in there. We're going to keep stirring that, and that's going to completely dissolve. And the gelatin is going to set as soon as it comes up to a simmer. So once it comes up to a simmer, we don't want to boil it. We want to just simmer it. Once we see a couple of smaller ripples in the in the in the top of the cream, we're gonna we're gonna take it off. It's going to be able to set itself up then.
Okay, so I'm gonna do that. We're gonna get out our dishes. Uh, when, you, when you're plating this dish up, uh, I, I have a sample a, a, a piece that I'll show you for plate up that I'm gonna do, but at home you wanna find uh, just a vessel. We use these, uh, I like to use these little plastic disposable cups just because it's easier. It's a good portion size for what you're doing if it's an appetizer. If, if you really like it, I mean, you can make them in this size if you wanted to. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do it in a, in a larger, uh, like a brulee or a, um, uh, uh, scallop potato dish and just leave it in there and people can just scoop it out as they as they want it um, once it sets up it's it's very nice to just serve that way and we are up to a simmer here so I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off go back to my make it easier for me to pour camera will get I'm sure he'll get a good shot of this here but uh, so I just lay them out usually put it on a sheet pan or in a pan that can and have a spot in your refrigerator all ready to go and uh, that's get that things a little uh, cookie sheet will be fine just lay them out on there and you're just gonna fill them up uh, to a level that's controllable so about three quarters a little over three quarters of the way And then we're going to set those in our refrigerator, as I said earlier. So we'll set these over here in the refrigerator. And then I brought a plate for us to do a little plate up on it for today. So the advantage of it being a... Um, that it's set up with the gelatin, it's, it's easier to handle. It doesn't want to fall out of the dish when it's set up, but it also comes out fairly easy. You just kind of pull on the sides. And it likes to, it likes to usually come out pretty easily. So we have a nice, a nice presentation. It has a nice looking uh, uh, size and shape and you put it on your plate. And then, oh, I forgot the basil and the relish, I'm sorry. We'll let that sit for a moment. We'll add some basil to our tomato relish. When you're cutting up basil, you want to make sure you use a very sharp knife. Basil likes to bruise and turn black on you if you don't uh, use a really sharp knife. And uh, I like to just take the leaves, roll them up, and this is what we call a chiffonade, which gives us a very nice um, thin uh, uh, form of, of basil in there, which uh, gives you a lot of flavor, but also still gives you the ability to be able to see it in the dish and doesn't just get uh, bruised and, and look like, like you're throwing parsley or, or something into the dish. So... So we're going to go ahead and for presentation for when our guests are knocking at our door waiting to eat, you take a, a little bit of your relish, just spin it right to the top of your panna cotta. A little bit of that, that the juice that's formed from the marinating of the tomatoes. Throw it on there and then you're going to have the basil around. Find a nice little basil leaf, the heart of the basil. Garnish yourself up here. Set it out. And something that your guests can enjoy. So, thank you. Do you have any questions? No questions? I got a question. Yes, sir. What do you got for me? I, thank you. I want to thank you, first of all. Thank coming up and uh, coming all the way out here to Hall. My pleasure. From Monterey. And, um, you know... Uh, So, can you tell us a little bit if you if you hadn't already about uh, Portola Plaza Hotel, Peter B's, uh, everything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're located in downtown Monterey. We're at Portola Hotel and Spa. Uh, we have Jack's Restaurant, uh, which is where you'll most likely see this dish in Jack's Restaurant, and we also have Peter B's, which is our craft brewery. Uh, we're, we were the first craft brewery in the Monterey Peninsula. We've been there for about 15 years, and uh, we have a full production brewery right on premise, and we produce about 16. Uh, house made half craft beers at a time that are on tap so uh, definitely come down and check us out we're in, like I said we're in the heart of Monterey at the end of Alvarado Street and we have a beautiful uh, garden atrium that is our lobby that you can stroll through uh, we have our lounge over there you can grab a cocktail come into Jack's uh, and just as Jack's Fair is it's 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 seasonal sustainable I just changed the menu last week we launched a new menu going in for early 
uh, early fall, uh, late summer menu. Uh, I work with our local fishermen, I work with our local farmers, and I get as much local as possible because I believe that we need to support our local community and some support the people that uh, are here to support us as well. So it's a give and take, and uh, I'm sure I take more than I can give, but uh, they have such fantastic product that uh, I really do enjoy uh, all that they're able to give to us and the bounty that we have available to us, and I try and present that back to, to you, the, the wonderful customers that come down and see us. So. Yeah. Is that Jerry? Is this work? Work? Yep, yep. Does yep. it work? Can you hear me out there? Yeah. Okay, good. Is that Jerry? Do you, you, you yeah, Jerry is my guy. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. He uh, texts me at 10 o'clock at night and says, I've got this on the boat. Do you need yeah. it? And I'll, I'm going to vouch for this guy. Okay. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a small ship network of people who we buy from. Used to be a secret, you know, uh, Swank Farms, which we, we're really prideful and we're really honored. That's kind of how we got him in here is, uh, you know, if Dick Swank, everybody knows Dick Swank around here. Uh, he's a part of our community and uh, Phil Foster, Foster Farms. In fact, they have both donated all this produce you see to this stage and uh, for up on stage. So we're gonna give you a couple cases uh, and thank take you. it away from us. We want uh, we want to really thank you for coming out here today. And uh, you know, thanks for promoting us here in San Diego County. It's my uh, pleasure. Uh, we're, we're all neighbors. We all gotta take we're care on. of each other. So thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, thank you. Jason. Appreciate it.